This is Beyond a Reasonable Doubt with your hosts, Mark Garrigus and Gary Smith. GPS, how are you this wonderful Sunday at the Altar of Bard? Mark, I am well. Happy Palm Sunday. I am uh, excited to see you. It's been a while since I've seen you in the flesh, so nice to connect with you via Zoom. Uh, happy to see you, too, and uh, happy Palm Sunday in the uh, home stretch of the Lenten uh, abstinence. Uh, so uh, I'm counting down the days. You know, the Armenians, we start on the Monday before Ash Wednesday, which is the traditional start. So we've got a two day head start. Yeah. I've learned a lot about the Armenian traditions this year and uh, last as well, but more this year as I've, I've made a few more friends around the office and it's very interesting the way you guys do it. You, uh, you go the extra mile above and beyond. We certainly do. Although if you're talking to Alex, um, (laughs) you know, she, uh, she tends to go on and off her Lenten abstinence, uh, if you haven't noticed. I will say the uh, the first week I learned quite a bit, and uh, by the second or third week I was asking questions about, uh, what, what did I, I thought I heard something different a few days ago. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. So. And, why are, and why are you downstairs in the bar if, uh, if, you're, on, if you're on Lent? She'll, she'll want to have a uh, rebuttal time. Um, I, have a, I have a question for you. Did you go to the L.A. Mag Women in Impact? Because I was not there. I did. Now, the L.A. Women's event, I will say, was fantastic in every sense besides my commute, because it might have well as been on Mars from where I live. It took about two hours and 30 minutes for me to get there and to get back. But it was in the beautiful Fairmont Miramar Hotel in Santa Monica. Uh, Chris Jenner was the keynote speaker, and there were several lovely panelists, including Christine Devine, who Los Angeles uh, news watchers will know. And uh, it was a an immaculate event. It was a beautiful hotel the ballroom looked amazing we had uh just just great speakers and uh, i will say everyone just blew it out of the park well that's fantastic but speaking of alex did she make it there alex absolutely did make it there she was very fortunate to uh, get a reprieve from her trial so she made it and uh, alice from our team made it all of uh, all of our team members were there and uh, everyone had a grand time it was uh, it was lovely Chris Jenner is impressive, isn't she? She really is. I mean, I'm not that I needed this event to uh, to discover that she's uh, clearly a uh, a boss lady, uh, for lack of a better term. And uh, she was up there, you know, very sadly for her, a few days on on the uh, a few days past a uh, a tragic uh, loss in her family. But she was there. She was uh, lovely and delightful and very nice to everyone who spoke to her. So uh, she was great. It was a, an awesome and, and event. By the way. One degree of separation from Armenia, kind of like you, you know, uh, she's married to the late great Bob Robert Kardashian. And yeah, she's got some. She's got some Armenian babies who are now all grown up, and uh, she's, as you said, boss lady, impressive woman. You know, for a lot of people, take their shots, and I've never quite understood it um, because uh, she really is. She really is an amazing, amazing. Mother, entrepreneur, manager, momager, yeah. all of the. No, I, I couldn't agree more. And she she spoke a little bit about that while she was on stage. And she talked about how, you know, these days her priority is um, how much time she gets to spend each day with her various grandchildren. And as I have become a father, uh, that makes all the sense in the world to me. And she, you know, I, I agree people take their shots, but it's hard to argue that she has not helped turn several of her children into millionaires and billionaires. And uh, she also is a very present grandmother and mother. And uh I, I just I don't necessarily get the hate. I, I get the jealousy, but the hate I don't necessarily understand. Yeah, kudos kudos to her. Um, speaking of hate, um, the uh, is how how do you like that for a segue? That's a great segue, Mark. Well, well done. Yeah, do you have a, do you have a clip of um, we've been covering for the last on and off for the last two months the uh, hearings on the uh, the out of Georgia uh, in regards to the conspiracy to. Uh, Oh, supposedly overturn the election. You have a, and for those who don't know, uh, this week coming on the heels of the judge's decision that one of them had to go, either Wade or Willis, and Wade immediately resigned. The then the there was, uh, you know, a lot of people assume you could immediately appeal things. 
that you, that's not the case. For what's called interlocutory, which means during, it's not a final ruling, meaning that it may be a final ruling in the trial court for the issue of the recusal. It's not final for the proceeding itself. The proceeding would go forward if you want to appeal or take a writ, which is technically the technical term. Generally, in most jurisdictions and federally, you're going to have to get permission. California, they call it a certificate of probable cause. Georgia, they have a different term for it. But uh, the judge here, because a lot of times the trial judge says, "Yeah, I'm not going to, I'm not going to certify it." Here, I believe he did. Yeah, I uh, yes, that is my understanding as well. And I do have a clip of Fani speaking uh, yesterday. As you listen to this, uh, she was at an event in. Um, Let's see here in College Park, Georgia, and uh, she was she was asked about the situation. So let's see what she had to say. I don't feel like my reputation needs to be reclaimed. Let's say it for the record. I'm not embarrassed by anything I've done. Um, You know, I guess my greatest crime is I had a relationship with a man, but that's not something that I find embarrassing in any way. Um, And I know that I have not done anything that's illegal. And so I don't feel like my reputation needs to be reclaimed. And when I tell you the outpouring of women, um, and I'll tell you this, especially African-American women who will just say, we are so proud, you are such a good representative of us. But I would be lying to say it's only African-American women. I have had Caucasian women, Asian women, Indian women. Um, I told Jeff one day, I didn't think I was the face of the feminist movement, but somehow I became it. And I, I think that women feel like women are treated differently when they're professionals. And they're proud to see someone that is strong and um, trying to do the right job. Certainly flawed, like every human being is flawed. Um, my father has a saying, only one perfect man walked the face of the earth and they crucified him. I am not a perfect human being, but what I am is a hardworking human being and a human being that loves the community I serve and who understands this seat does not belong to me. It belongs to the people. And as long as I'm here, I'm going to try to do the job in a way that's honorable. Look at her. She's the, she's going to take the uh, take the high road, uh, apparently, as a feminist icon who uh, did nothing wrong. Yeah, that's um, certainly an interesting position to take. Um, she does emphasize there that she didn't do anything illegal. Um, maybe. You know, it's an interesting position to take uh, the. You know, the on one hand, normally my inclination would be to uh, support someone in her position who's being attacked or maligned and things like that. But as somebody who practices and has practiced criminal defense, uh, even though I readily admit not as much as I once did as a proportion of my practice, you know, the uh, you've heard me, Gary, uh, you could almost apprentice uh, in the law. Uh, say before, a prosecutor is held to a higher standard, and there is a reason, a good reason for that. I mean, we are at a point, um, both in the federal and the state courts, where the prosecution holds, in my opinion, way too much power um, vis-a-vis the other actors in the criminal justice system, and especially judges. I think judges have been diminished in the amount of power that they have. I mean, they federally, the prosecutor, people don't understand the prosecutors federally bring the charges and can pretty much game the system uh, and the guidelines as to what they bring, how many charges they bring, whether they supersede, whether they drag in the women and children. And that's a, that's an unbelievably awesome, awesome, not, uh, complimentary necessary, Correct. but also the expansive nature of the power. And that uh, that also applies to the state courts and the prosecutors pretty much control the board. And, you know, she will see, you can see what happens if a prosecutor or a judge doesn't toe the line. She's getting run against. Um, the judge McAfee is getting run against. And generally, in the past, it's been um, by other prosecutors who then say, "I'm, you know, I'm tougher on crime than they're tougher on crime." There, uh, it's uh, so when you say, "I haven't done anything," and you're going to wrap yourself up in the mantle of um, 
you know, as a feminist icon, it uh, there is a certain degree of irony there. And, you know, the irony as I listen to it reminds me of Trump when Trump is at his rallies talking about that, you know, they're not really indicting me, they're indicting you, they're coming after MAGA. And that's kind of what she's saying here. They're not really coming after me, they're coming after women, or they're coming after this or that. So, you know, there is a certain, you know, for every yin, there is a yang, and that seems to be what's happening here. Yeah, certainly. And, you know, you talk about the the awesome power yielded by prosecutors, you know, and awesome, not in the uh, the sense of the word that maybe people my age would normally use it, but uh, expansive. Not like awesome Dawson. Correct. So, not like awesome Dawson, but, you know, expansive and, uh, you know, exceptional. Um, you know, it, we've talked about in the past, you know, for instance, the Menendez case where it was tried the first time with a set of rules, then it gets covered by the media. The DA comes under pressure and all of a sudden it's tried the second time with a different set of rules and then the result comes out the way the prosecutor wanted it you know that's a that is an awesome amount of power to be able to arrange the chessboard in the way that you want to try to game the game the system and get the outcome that you're looking for and that's something i think we need to be concerned about you know it's interesting you mentioned menendez because our the one of the first documentaries that um that uh you know, your your employer has put together has been this uh, Menendez documentary uh, that I liked um, the previous title. I'm not a, uh, a, a huge fan of the current title, but I am a huge fan of um, the somebody shining a spotlight on it, on what happened to them. And I don't think I need to say the in the interests of full disclosure, I'm represent them i i feel like i've come to be very close to the the case in the sense that it's interesting the way i got close to that case is actually through this podcast gary because you'll remember adam has for years made the argument that he didn't understand really why they were still in custody because and he loses he jokes around in fact last when natalia was uh, last time I saw Natalia, one of the last times I uh, talked to her, I, I said uh, I was teasing her about the fact that Adam always uses her and, as an example of if Natalia comes in and yeah. blows my brains out on the couch. Well, hold on. I- hold on. It's if Natalia goes to Sonny and says, hey, what are you doing tonight? You want to blow mom and dad's brains out? And Sonny says, good idea. Then they've they've made grave mistakes as parents. That That's always been his joke, I believe. <laughs> Pretty amazing. And so it drops. uh, We're taping this on the 24th of March and the documentary drops tomorrow. It would be very interesting to see what people's reaction is to uh, to this. I mean, you know, we're as of right now, as we said, April 11th, the D.A. has uh, got a deadline to respond to the judges issuing of the order or the. The, but yeah, it's technically an order asking for an informal reply on the habeas that's based on the Roy Rosello declaration, who used to be with Menudo, um, Neri Inkle, who's the one who, the documentarian who found Roy and, and got him to speak out. And then also on the letter that was found um, in the things by Marta Cato of her son, who's now passed away, which the, the DA is examining, I, uh, I think, in fact, they, in their application, I'm not talking out of school, their application for a continuance, which the judge granted until two weeks from uh, tomorrow, I believe. They, they cite the fact that they're looking at that letter prior to uh, responding to the habeas. And, uh, you know, I'm just hopeful at a certain point, given the fact that the law has changed, Given the fact that society has evolved, it, it I think it's time after 34 years for these uh, these I keep saying the boys because they're they're forever kind of implanted in my brain as uh, sure. as being a teenager and just outside of his teens, uh, Lyle just being you know a little bit older. Um, that after 34 years, given everything they've accomplished in custody without any expectation that they had any possibility of ever leaving uh it's a it's a phenomenal thing that they have done both individually and uh together 
uh, some of the laundry lists or the litany of things that they've done while they've been in prison. And by the way, I'm not the only one who's just the defense lawyer. I know I often people often be dismissive and say, hey, you represent them. But there's been correctional officers who have never written letters before who have weighed in and said, uh, you know, I would not. Not only do I think they they should be resentenced, not only do I think that they should be out, I would welcome them to my neighborhood. That's quite a statement, by the way. It really is. And there, yeah, you, you, you're you not, you know, I understand that for listeners of this podcast, there might be a, a tendency to say, well, you're involved in the case. So, you know, you, you might be biased, but, you know, there's been more than enough, uh, fo- you know, uh, product and and material that has been put out there by people who have no involvement in the case and who have gotten uh, input from people who definitely have no dog in the fight to uh, to certainly raise eyebrows. And I would say that's something that people should be looking at where uh, where exactly can people watch the uh, the documentary that's dropping tomorrow? I believe, on, I believe on it, that it drops on Fox Nation. I believe so, too. Uh, there is a promo out. I did a you know, this is one of the more surprising things while I was here in New York. I went down the street to Fox to uh, do a uh, an interview with Judge Janine, and I don't know if you can find it while we're um, while we're talking. Apologies but, for my eyes. Yes, I know you get you get quite a bit of flack for that, but don't worry, you don't read the comments, so you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> the Judge Janine, who for those who don't know, was a hard charging DA in Westchester County. Um, uh, outside of the uh, city and um, has always, I've known her for decades and uh, fought with her uh, for decades. Uh, this is one of the few times that I can remember where she and I have been absolutely on the same page in a case. And she, uh, you know, in talking with her, she had the same kind of, and I've said this is a function of, I really believe, it's a function of people who try or have tried cases, that if you try a case, all you really ask for out of a out of a judge and, and your opposing counsel is that you know what the rules are and that you don't have the rules changed in the middle of the game. I often say about judges, I don't mind if the judge hammers me as long as the he or she is an equal opportunity curmudgeon is what I always say or uh, slammer. But the idea here that there was a first trial that the majority of the jurors in the first trial with two juries. So they deliberated separately, one for Lyle, one for Eric. They deliberated separately and they found not that, you know, they weren't, the argument isn't that they were not guilty, meaning let me go. It was not guilty of murder because they were guilty of manslaughter because they were battered. And what people don't understand is when all of the evidence was allowed in trials, number one, one A and one B, I'll call them, the jurors were almost evenly split, even though they had deliberated separately between murder and manslaughter. Then in between and before trial number two, where it was just one jury for the both of them, OJ gets convicted. Eight days, I believe, before the jury was selected in the next case. The DA at the time is in the fight for his life. And what ends up happening? All of a sudden... Evidence starts getting excluded. Jury instructions start getting changed. Right. And the DA takes the position that there was no abuse and that they were just whiny rich kids. And by the way, the, the idea of a uh, two, two guys who are already living a very, very cush life and are, by all accounts are, are rich to begin with, Murdering their parents so they could continue to be rich makes zero sense because it wasn't like they were wanting for anything. So you have to say to yourself, what was really going on both in their lives to get them to the point where they would commit these acts? Also, what was going on 
between trial number one and trial number two, where all of a sudden the rules change in between. Yeah. Now I have found this interview. It's about three minutes. I don't know how uh, YouTube's going to feel about us playing it, but if you would like to play it, we can. Um, but in the meantime, uh, before we make that decision, uh, because you brought up Adam and his daughter, Natalia, I just want to share something. I'm not sure if you've seen. Uh, this is a, a photo that I think that the uh, listeners of this podcast might be interested in. I came across this on the Internet the other day, uh, just stumbled, stumbled across it. And uh, I, I, I well, you want to know how I knew about this? Yeah, please. Adam texted me and said I missed a very good lobster cob salad. I was supposed to be not meeting with him and the president. I was supposed to be meeting with Adam and two other people and did not get out of New York in order to meet him down there. And I got I got this picture along with uh, you missed a really good lobster to Cobb salad uh, comment. Well, that's but a very the- that's a very funny text. And sorry for listeners of this podcast who may not be watching on YouTube and you should be and you should be subscribing YouTube dot com slash reasonable doubt podcast. But for listeners, I'm showing a picture of Adam and former President Trump at Mar-a-Lago. And uh, wow, I was uh, a little shook when this uh, this picture came across my timeline. It's uh I don't know. I'm I'm just out of the orbit a little bit. So I, I had no idea what to expect, but I thought that was an interesting picture. Well, by, by the way, put it back up for one sec. Cause you know, the guy, me, as you might know, what is Trump doing? He's because- trying to do a thumbs up, but he's got his hand at such an angle that it sort of looks like he's pointing his thumb at the camera. At least that's the way I read it. When I looked at it, well, I-, I, I was commenting more on, he looks a lot more fit than in other pictures I've seen. I'm not sure I would say fit, but slimmer. I would, I would agree with. <laughs> I mean, look, the guy's what? 77. I'm going to give him fit. You no, know, he looks, gonna, he, he looks good for, hanger, for everybody who knows my political uh, persuasion. Um, but uh, he looks, he looks better than I've he looks better than I've seen in a lot of pictures. Again, I'm I, I take exception to the word fit, but for 77, I will agree with you that he looks he looks very well compared to some of the pictures I've seen in the past decade or so. And look at Adam. He had to wear a coat. Do you think I've never that, seen uh, Adam smile that big, by the way? Well, I'm not, I'm not so sure. And I haven't talked to him, so I'll have to ask. I bet you that he showed up there for the lunch without a coat. And <laughs> he's got the, the Friars coat. Club jacket that they provide you yeah, when you get it there. It does not look like a, a coat that he has ever worn or that is remotely his size. Well, I will say that it it fits him better than I would expect a coat to fit him. And I m- might give Adam the benefit of the doubt and say that while he did not pack that coat, there might be someone in his life who thought to do so. I don't know. I have uh, you know, this is. We'll, we'll get hey, you want to be on the Adam hater side. side. I can get on board. I mean, I'm just, you know, if, if you want to give Adam shit, I can get there. But I just I'm trying to give him the benefit of the doubt a little bit. Well, by the way, he's one of my closest friends in the world. So I, so uh, I wouldn't call it here. I just call it the uh, well, the I'm friendly hater. I don't of one of your bros kind of uh, uh, deal. So, but uh, a free swag to the first person who gets the accurate real story. And I'll get it from Adam. So he'll be the judge. Perfect. So, uh, by the way, do we have a comment of the week before we go? I mean, I, as you said, I'm not in the comments, so that's going to have to come from you there, big guy. We had two last week and uh, both of them, <laughs> both of them uh, got their swag sitting on uh, on uh, Sarnell's desk. I, I know she's been a little sick this week, so I'm not sure when it'll go out, but they've been sitting there for a few days. And uh, yeah, we uh, we're, we're starting to run low on on uh, on swag there. The, this has been so successful. Everyone wants their sweatshirt. We may have to uh, have Lucas fire up that order and get a new uh, new batch in. You may be, you may be right. And I, you know, I had, I had a number of them that I liked this week. I'm going to have to go back and maybe you'll tweet it midweek. And then uh, sure. as the winner, because you and I are going to have to decide, because I, I didn't pick out a clear winner, but there was, there was like one that really slammed us good. And I, and I, you know, I enjoy a good slam. And then there were a couple that were very complimentary. So you know, it was kind of a yin and a yang. So we'll have to decide between them. Well, we certainly, 
Yeah, we've certainly awarded swag to both sides. So don't feel like you need to uh, suck up if you want to get a sweatshirt, because there have been ones that have just absolutely taken me apart. And I've texted the mark and said, go for it. This is great. This this is a sweatshirt winner because, you know, might not feel good uh, uh, when it comes to my feelings. But the uh, the slam was was warranted. So by all means, uh, take us apart if we deserve it. Slam is clever. Yeah, exactly. If you make a good point, very good, clever slam. Yeah. Hey, everybody, what's up? It's Gina Grad. And when you're searching for the perfect piece of jewelry, it can be hard to find a brand you trust. Alex and Ani has been creating meaningful jewelry for over 20 years, designing pieces that connect you with all of life's important moments. With an emphasis on value, there is truly something for everyone. They've recently launched their everyday collection, I could not love it more. These pieces are made from stainless steel and an advanced water resistant plating method that doesn't tarnish. It has the look of real gold. It's beautiful. I love these pieces because they feel so classic, but they have so much versatility. Alex and Ani are also featuring some gorgeous pieces that I have right here, like Black Lotus, this gorgeous Black Lotus charm necklace, and their Stay Wild pendant, and their Wings of Protection necklace that have a classic and vintage vintage feel. See that? And of course, you can't forget their signature bangle bracelets, which I'm also wearing. And I have a lot of their stuff. I have the numerology bracelets. I have the hula dancer to commemorate a meaningful trip I took to Hawaii. From classic to bold statement pieces, Alex and Ani makes it easy to sprinkle your personality into each piece or make a truly meaningful gift for someone you care about. Meanwhile, you can take comfort in knowing that you're shopping with a socially conscious brand. As Alex and Ani has donated over six $60 million to nonprofits worldwide, connecting fashion and philanthropy in an easy, fun, affordable way. Right now, Alex and Ani is offering our audience 20% off. So check their gorgeous collection out at alexandani.com and use the promo code MIDAS. That's M-E-I-D-A-S at alexandani.com. Use that promo code at checkout for 20% off your order. Come and get something beautiful. Um, all right, real quick before we go, uh, the Shohei Otani situation is something that I have been watching. I'm not a big baseball fan, but uh, I am certainly a fan of of you know intrigue. And uh, when it comes to betting in baseball, uh, the Major League Baseball takes that very seriously. Just uh, head out to Vegas and go to uh, the Caesars, uh, you know, Caesars Shopping Mall and ask Pete Rose because he's been there every single time I've been to Vegas in the past 15 years. So Shohei Otani is in hot water because. His interpreter and longtime friend who is from Diamond Bar, California, which is right here in L.A. County, uh, allegedly uh, was in a great deal of debt, somewhere between four and five million dollars. And there have been three or four different variations of this story in the past week. And, uh, you know, I I would just love to hear your thoughts on it. Well, I'm going to tell you, the first story that came out was was it toggled very quickly. There was the idea that it was a theft, um, that the interpreter had stolen this money. But that quickly followed on the heels, it looks like, if you're doing the timeline, of that he had accessed the interpreters because they're such close friends, and he had voluntarily paid this. And it morphed by the next day to it was a theft. And a cynic cynics are already saying what if there's a third alternative it wasn't him uh actually paying for a friend it wasn't him being stolen from by a friend but it was the friend who was actually covering for him and that's why major league baseball is in there and it's very very interesting as to how this is going to develop yeah absolutely we're going to be following it closely because it is as you said very very interesting and we haven't really covered it but his historic recent contract for over 700 million dollars that he has deferred almost all of he's been he's being paid one million dollars a year over the course of his contract which i believe is 12 years i could be wrong on that that's just from memory but he has deferred all but one million dollars a year from his contract and it is a very clever tax move because he is going to move back to Japan by all accounts and probably will uh, be able to escape a lot of the taxes that he would have been paying if he had been paid that contract while he was living in California playing for the Dodgers. 
Oh, good luck with the franchise tax board. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, you know, now what? We're we, trying to extradite him from Japan. Well, yeah. Now, now they've got their uh, their new rules in place where if you move out of LA County, you still pay taxes for uh, quite a long time. So, uh, fun times to uh, to be a California resident. Uh, Mark, thank you so much for your time. Uh, we touched on a lot of topics that uh, I don't think either of us knew we were going to touch on. It was a good time. Yeah, thanks, Gary. It's always good to see you. I'll see you this week. All right. Looking forward to it. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to Reasonable Doubt. Subscribe on YouTube at youtube.com slash reasonable doubt podcast.